Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone out this morning. I, I noticed this morning that our sign out front says pray hard. How about it. Pray hard for our, our nation. I don't know if you saw this week or not, or read or whatever that you know they passed a our leaders passed the mandate there'll be no live nativities in Washington, DC this year. It's the world that we live in today, but they said to the conservative religious people they said don't worry it doesn't have anything to do with religion <laughs> we searched all of washington dc and we couldn't find three wise men <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said this morning we're going to continue with our our study on worship um, as we look into uh What's our purpose in this? Why, why are we to worship? And uh, we'll see the reason for that this morning. And so with that, let's have a word of prayer and see what the Lord has to say here this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we, we do recognize this morning, Lord, that the whole reason we are here this morning is for you so that we can bring honor to you, that we can bring glory to you, that we can bring our worship to you, Father. And so, Father, we pray that our hearts and our thoughts will all be focused on you this morning so that you can get the worship that you deserve. And we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This morning, we're going to be looking at the uh, fifth chapter of Revelation. Uh, we're also going to look at some scripture in Nehemiah and probably about a whole bunch more scripture. <laughs> but uh, the two key sections will be Revelations and Nehemiah this morning. So if you'll open up to Revelations chapter 5, we'll look at verses 9 through 14. Section I'm sure we've, we've all <clears throat> are familiar with. <clears throat> And as we start there, verse 9, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voices of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. And they encircled the throne the, and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. See, years ago, a man named Mike Royko reported this true story in the Chicago Tribune. He said, a man named Bill Mallory traveled to India to discover the purpose of life. But he didn't find the answer there. Imagine that. <laughs> so after returning from India to the States here, he noticed a sign at a Chevron gas station that simply said, as you travel, ask us. So every time he pulled into a Chevron station, he would look to the sign and say, I'm a traveler. I'd like to ask you a question. What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? I'm going to share with you the, the real answers that I got, that he got, I'm sorry. These, these aren't made up answers. This is what the people said to him. The first guy said, sorry, 
I'm new here. <laughs> <laughs> the second guy said, at the next gas station, he said, well, I don't remember that in the, the manual. I don't remember reading anything about that. Another guy said to him, well, I'm not much for church myself, sir. One guy gave him a leering look and a wink, whatever that meant. However, he said most of the people that he asked this question to, they just gave him a blank stare, cleaned his windshield. But he kept asking at every Chevron station, what is the purpose of life? Well, one day he got a phone call from Chevron's customer relations. <laughs> And they said to him, we understand you've been asking our dealers questions and getting unsatisfactory answers. The man suggested that he write out his question and send it to Chevron Corporation and with the self-addressed stamped envelope to see if they could give him the answer. So he, Bill Mowry simply wrote, what is the purpose of life? And he sent it off to the Chevron company. A couple weeks later, the envelope returned. And the only thing that was in the envelope was an application for a credit card. <laughs> if you want to know the purpose of life, you're not going to find it at a gas station. You're not going to find it from a talk show host. You're not going to find it in a self-help book. You're not going to find it traveling the world. You're not going to find it at a seminar. See, if you want to know the purpose of life, you need to look to the creator, the one who made you, or at least go to his owner's manual, to the book, the instructions. See, we were made by God, and we were made for God. And until you understand that simple statement, Life's not going to make much sense to you. See, the first thing I want, to, want you to see is that, that we were made for thy pleasure, for his pleasure. In uh, chapter of Revelations 4, 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Underline that statement in your Bibles, please, for thy pleasure. We were created for God's enjoyment, for his pleasure. God made you just to enjoy you. See, he planned you for his purpose. And the only reason that you're alive today is that God wanted you. He wants you alive. He, he gets enjoyment out of watching you and you being alive. Now, if you're a parent, if you're an aunt, you're, if you're an uncle, if, you know, if you're somebody that, that enjoyed watching kids as they grew up, you know what this is saying. I'm sure the same is with God that, that, well, most of the time he enjoys watching us. <laughs> We're not perfect, right? But he enjoys watching you and me. We see here that we were made for God's pleasure. The day that you were born, God was there in that room, smiling down on you, smiling at your birth because he created you to enjoy you. He made you for his purpose. And his purpose is that he wants you to bring enjoyment to him. And since he created us, he wants us to love him back. We find a story in Matthew 22, verses 7 and uh, 37 and 38, where Jesus says to a man who was walking down the street, the man comes up to him and says, Hey, What's the most important commandment of all? Legitimate question, right? Good question. What's that most important commandment in all the scriptures? I need to know. 
And Jesus said, if you will, if I could paraphrase what he said, the, the most important commandment of, of all the scriptures is this. He's telling me, if you, if you don't get anything else, get this. This will summarize all the scriptures. And Jesus said in verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, he says. So God is saying to you today, if you don't get anything else, if you don't learn anything else about worship, if you don't get anything else today, the number one purpose in life is to learn to love God because he made you. He made you and he wants you to love him and he wants you to know him. And he loves you. And he wants you to love him back. See, there's a word for this. It's a, it's a word that often gets misunderstood. So a lot of people don't use the word properly. That word is worship, folks. He wants our worship. See, worship is knowing and loving God back for him loving you. When I say the word worship, what do you think of? You may say prayer. You may think of singing. You might think of the, the rituals or communion going to church or or something that you do in church. That's what people think of when they, they think of worship. But we know from what we've studied so far that the worship is so much more than that, isn't it? It's far more than all these things. But we see here in the scripture that, that our very first purpose in life is to worship God. That's why he created us. It should be our primary objective. It should be our, our highest priority. See, because it's our number one purpose in life is to worship our creator. Now, probably the best verse that defines worship, the, the best verse that describes your, your very first purpose is this. It says, because of God's great mercy to us, that we're to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing him. We're familiar with that in Romans, aren't we? Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. As we look at these verses and we look at them close, we see that there's a couple things that we need to understand. And the first thing is that worship is, is our, my response to God's love. Worship is just the way that, that I react, that I respond to, to God when he loves me, which, by the way, is all the time. That's what worship is. Notice it says because. It's because of, of God's great mercy. It's because of his love toward us that we want to worship him back. You see, God takes the initiative. God always makes the first move. God never asks us to make the first move. He always makes the first move. You see, he created us. He brought us into being. He saves us. He forgives us. He blesses us. He protects us. He does all these things. And then because of these things, we should want to worship him. See, because the second thing we see is that worship is giving back to God. Worship is giving back to God. He gives to us. We give back to him. Whenever you give back to God, that is whenever you offer anything to God. See, that's 
called worship. Anything you offer to him is worship because that brings pleasure to him when we give back to him. It brings enjoyment to God. When you are grateful to your heavenly father, that brings pleasure to him. So I beg to ask the question then, when the scripture says offer, what do you offer God? What do you give to the God of the universe who has everything? You know, you think you have a hard time finding a Christmas gift for someone that has everything. What about finding a gift for God? Think about it. He made the world. He made you. He made this universe that we're in. So what do you give him? Well, it's simple. You give him your love. And he's very specific about how we give that love in mark 12 30 he says love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind and all your strength god wants me and you to love him he wants us to do it thoughtfully with our minds he wants us to do it passionately with our heart and with our soul. And he wants us to do it practically with his strength. See, worship is, by, is when we focus our attention on God. Here's a bunch of scriptures referring to that. Psalms 139, 1 through 3 says, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, and you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Romans 8, 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. We have to worship him with our mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've seen this how many times now in Romans 12, verse 2. So that we are able to test and approve what God's will is for us. That's his good and his pleasing will and perfect will for us. Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Psalms 105.4 says, look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Isaiah 26.3 says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Worshiping him with our minds. Worshiping is expressing our affection to God. 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. Remember, he always takes the initiative first. Hosea 6.6 6 says, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice. An acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offering. Exodus 34.14, do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. He wants all of us, our entire being. Romans 6, 13 says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself as an instrument of righteousness. Set your affections towards God. And then use your abilities for God. Worship God by using your abilities. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord. Not for human masters, 
but for the Lord. Romans 12 again says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Why? Because it says, this is your true and proper worship. He wants us all. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9 says, so we make it our goal to please him. To please him, whether we are at home in the body or whether we're away from it with him. But we're doing everything to please him. We are focusing our attention on God. We're focusing our affections on God. And we're going to use the, the gifts, the abilities that he's given us for him. To bring pleasure to him. Think about what happened with Nehemiah as they rebuilt the walls. Think about the worship that happened there in Nehemiah chapter 8. There was a, a, a paramedic that was asked on a local Dallas TV talk show pro program. They said to him, what was your most unusual and challenging 911 call? He thought a little bit and he said, well, recently, paramedic began. We got a call from that big white church on 11th and Walnut Street, he said. A frantic usher was very concerned that during their worship service, an elderly man passed out in a pew and appeared to be dead. The usher could find no pulse and there was no noticeable breathing. So the interviewer said, well, what was so unusual and demanding about that particular call? Well, the paramedic said, we carried out four guys before we found the one that was actually dead. <laughs> A lot of people go to church on Sunday. Many people go for their whole life and never truly experience the worship of God. There's this little saying about modern man and his worship that goes like this. Modern man worships his work works at his play, and plays at his worship. Certainly hope that that is not us. So we're here at Nehemiah this morning, and we turn our attention to what the Jewish people did after the wall was built. They spent basically two months in intense labor, working around the clock to, to rebuild the walls. And, and at this point, the wall is finished. It's done. But see, the real work has just begun. And God's real purpose for the wall is just beginning. Thank God that his people in Jerusalem did not have that monumental uh, mentality. They didn't see building the wall as the ultimate goal. They understood that what went on inside the walls was what was really going to matter. What will, will happen now inside was, was the reason that the wall was built in the first place. And once the wall was finished, the, the very first thing that people wanted to do was they wanted to hear from God. They wanted to worship the one who had been with them as they had built the walls. See, they began to worship, and they had what we would call an old-fashioned revival meeting. See, this revival was based on the Word of God, on Scripture. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8, please, and we'll take a look at what, what went on as they finished the wall. Nehemiah 8, verse 1 says, All the people came together as in one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, 
to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. Now, folks, that would be about from 7 a.m. this morning till noon. If you were looking at it in today's time frame here. As he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand, and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. And here's where it gets tough. <laughs> Beside him on the right stood Mattatiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah. And on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Ashbadadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Well, I'm glad we used Joe and Bill and Bob and Jesse <laughs> for the kids' names today. And Ezra opened the book. And all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And he opened it, and the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then the Levites, Yeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub. Shebathiah, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Jazabad, Hanan, Peleah. They instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. See, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. And then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. See, the Jewish people here were experiencing what we call true worship. We see many things in this scripture modeling true worship. We're going to focus on three of them this morning. The first thing we see here is that true worship involves a longing for God's word. A longing for God's word. Look at verse 1. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out. Bring out the book of the law of Moses. Which the Lord had commanded for Israel. See, the, the people gathered together for one purpose. They had a longing for God's word. They longed to hear the book of the law of Moses. That's all they had had at the time. But they, they longed to hear from God through his word. See, true worship will always involve longing for God's word. True worship will always involve wanting to hear from God. Be still and know that I am God. It requires listening. Do you truly worship 
when you come to church? Do, do you long for, for God's word to be read? Have you been longing for God's word all week this week? A little boy brought his father the family Bible from the coffee table. He says, hey, Daddy, what's this? It's the Bible. And it's God's book, his dad replied. The little boy said, then we better give it back to him since we don't use it. <laughs> Another lady wanted to impress the preacher when he dropped by for a visit. She said to her daughter, honey, go get the blessed book that mommy so loves. She ran off and returned with the Sears catalog. Then one day after church, a preacher saw one of his members left the, the church and they had their left their Bibles lay on the pew. He called out to them and said, hey, you left your Bibles behind. That's all right, Pastor. We won't need them till next week. Sad, isn't it? See, worship is an everyday thing. And in order to worship, we need to have that hunger for God's word. How can we say that we worship someone who desires to talk to us, who, who desires to commune with us, but we don't want to hear what their word has to say to us? The people, after they built the wall, they long to hear from God that day. Do you long to hear from God? These people in Nehemiah's day didn't have a Bible like we have today. They didn't have a phone with an app on it that has 53 different versions of the Bible on it. They couldn't set a time every day to listen and commune with God. See, they had to have someone read the scriptures to them. There wasn't a copy in every household. They could have used that as an excuse, folks. They could have said, I, I can't read. I don't have a copy of it. I don't want to hear God's word. But they didn't. They did just the opposite. They requested that Ezra bring out the book, bring out the scripture, bring it out and read it to us so we can worship our God. So what's our excuse? See, we as Christians, we must long for God's word. If you truly want to worship God, you better have a desire in your heart for his word. The next thing we see is that when the book was read, when, when the scripture was read, when they said, hey, bring it out, they listened. They listened to God's word. Look at verse 3. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively. They didn't fall over in the pew, but they couldn't tell which ones were dead and which ones were alive. They listened attentively to the book of the law. Verse 8, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. The people, they, they listened while the Levites and the priests read and explained to them what God had to say to them. See, folks, they heard a sermon. <laughs> Verse 3 said that they read from morning until around noon. And the people listened closely to what was being said. And after that, in verse 8, you see the preachers took over. They then, to the people, explained what, what these scriptures meant, what these words meant. The King James Version's translation has a, a great description of the scene. It says, so they read in the book the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand 
the reading. They gave the sense, they, they gave the meaning of the word. See, folks, that's expository preaching at its best. They took God's word, they read it, and they helped the people understand what was being said. But see, in order to understand what's being said, you have to listen. You have to listen to what was being said. My wife has some amazing listening abilities. I can remember when our boys were just little babies. It seems like an eternity ago. We'd be in bed or in another room and, and Linda would suddenly stop and say, did you hear that? Hear what? Or she'd suddenly wake me up in the middle of the night and declare, hey, the baby's awake. What? Huh? <laughs> well, guess what? It's your turn to take care of it. <laughs> I swear she could hear the slightest change in her breathing. Why do you suppose that was? It's because she was listening. She was listening for them. It was important for her to listen for them. There was a boy who took his girlfriend to a football game for the very first time. Naturally, after the game, he asked his girlfriend, how'd you like the game? Oh, I really liked it, she said. But I just couldn't understand why they were killing each other for 25 cents. What on earth do you mean, he said. Well, she says, I saw them flip the coin, and one team got it, and then the rest of the game, all they kept screaming was, get the quarterback, get the quarterback. <laughs> See, we must listen to God's word as it's proclaimed. We must understand what it is that God is saying to us. Donald Whitney writes about listening and understanding and applying God's word in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. He writes this on page 88. Since worship is focusing on God and responding to God, regardless of what else we are doing, we are not worshiping if we are not thinking about God. We're not worshiping if we're not thinking about God. See, you can be here listening to a sermon and thinking about lunch or hunting. But without being here and listening to the sermon and thinking how God's truths apply to your life and how it can affect your relationship with him, if you're not focusing like that, then you're not worshiping, folks. You're just filling a spot in the pew. True worship involves listening to God's word when it's being preached or taught or read. We see here in Nehemiah that, that the people of Israel, they listened to God's word. I'm going to save the third one for last because we're running out of time. So let's close with the word of prayer. We prepare our hearts for the worship service this morning to listen to what God has to say to us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we do live in this land of the free. And that today, right now, it's easy for us to come out and worship you. Father, I pray that we never take that for granted. But I also pray, Father, that we recognize that we don't have to come here to worship you. May 
that we recognize, Father, that worship is something that we can do every day, every moment of every day, in all the things that we do. Because we're to do everything that we do is unto the Lord. So, Father, we pray that throughout this week, our thoughts and our ears and our hearts will be focused on you and what it is that you have for us to learn, for us to hear, and for us to do so that we can truly give you the worship that you deserve, Father. So that we can be obedient followers of, followers of Christ and bring you the honor and the glory that you so deserve. And we ask this all in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen.